Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If you haven't met Carol Wellsman, Dave Young. Uh, I want to just start off by saying it was very important for us, uh, Kelly and myself, to start uh, this series with a lot of Canadian jazz talent. And I think uh, what we were able to put together, what, what you, Dave, were able to put together for us, uh, is an amazing array of talent. We've got so much Toronto jazz talent in, in town that's uh, pretty much unheralded, I would say. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Young and, and a little older, if I might say. Well, some of us have to lead the other guys, you know. <laughs> Uh, let me start a uh, question with you, Dave. Uh, Oscar um, had a stroke, as I think many of you know, in 1993, which, which left him not playing the piano for uh, quite a while. Uh, and he writes in his book, and uh, I've heard him say that uh, besides Celine, his daughter, who made him play checkers to use his, his hands and, and to get his dexterity back, uh, you were one of the uh, key people that got him to play again. Tell me a little bit about how that happened. <sighs> Well, this was not, this was just between two friends, really. Um, I kind of, uh, I persisted, you know, I would phone him and he said, oh yeah, I'm not feeling good today. And da, 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 da. Okay, well, I'll have to call you again. And, and then after several times of this, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to come out and we'll, we're just going to talk. He said, okay. So I came out and then I said, I think we should go down the basement, down, downstairs and uh, play a couple of tunes. No, no. So eventually we did. So I brought the bass, went downstairs, and started playing over the, the, the repertoire. And uh, it was a bit of a struggle at the beginning, but I'm telling you, his eyes just lit up. And I mean, I think he was overcome. As was Kelly, who was present the whole moment, and Celine. So it, it just kind of developed from there. It was nothing planned. The, the first concert I ever did with Oscar was in 1995. Uh, so very soon after he came back to start playing and it was at the Ravinia Festival and it was a four day festival so the artists were around. And I remember uh, Oscar taking the stage and Mel Torme was there and Joe Williams was there and, and a lot of other great players and, and singers. And I think they were all a little nervous because they didn't know what was gonna come out of his fingers. Mm -hmm. And they were all standing side, uh, on the side of the stage with me uh, kind of wishing and hoping that they could still hear the old Oscar Peterson, and they and they heard pretty much the old Oscar Peterson. Uh, I think I think he would agree that the left hand didn't have the power anymore that that it did, but it still had an incredible left hand. He still had an incredible left hand, and the and the right hand, the the, the harmonic uh, imagination was clearly yeah, still there. That still never there. left. There were several pianists who, after this stroke, and several a couple of years later, they said. What does it matter? I mean, Oscar can play more with his right hand than most guys do with both hands, so he's still, <laughs> still up playing most of us anyway, so. Tell, tell me a little bit about this setup, because this, this is not the way a lot of jazz quartets, quintets set up. Usually the piano's on this side, the bass player's over here, a drummer's kind of in the middle. That's right. This is the Oscar Peterson setup for a trio or quartet, so we thought we would stick to that setup. It, only because geographically we're all close together and he can, uh, the pianist can direct things or whoever is in charge, but it, it's more, we're together, we're more together physically with the drums and the other guys over on the far side, it's less cohesive. This is better. Well, I notice when you're playing, your, your head is kind of almost on the keys and, uh, and I, I, the, same, <laughs> the same thing happened with, with Nils Henning, Orsted Pedersen, and a little bit with Ray Brown. He was a little taller, but um, is it, it, was it easier to play with Oscar being that close to his, his bass hand as a bass player? Absolutely, because I could watch his left hand. I mean, a, a lot of times his left hand would go in different places than we were accustomed. So <laughs> you had to be visually connected as well as musically. So it was always a help to see his left hand. Carol, let me ask you, well, welcome back home, by the way. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. <laughs> For those of you who don't uh, know, Carol has a new record out called I Like Men. Uh, so I won't ask you about all the men you've liked. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 
you have a, a, a history with the Royal Conservatory that goes back before any of us in this room were born. Uh, tell, tell, me about, uh, tell me about your grandfather. Well, back in uh, 1906, my grandfather uh, was a very brave man and, and assembled a group of musicians and decided to call them the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. And so he conducted the Toronto Symphony up until the end of 1917 and funded it out of his own pocket for the last couple of years and uh, then decided that uh, he would move on. And where did he move to but the Royal Conservatory. And so he worked here for many years. And uh, I'll never forget, we had a piano tuner at our cottage one summer and he said, Wellsman, I know that name. He was my examiner for my grade nine exam and I played one wrong note and he threw my book across the room. <laughs> I said, well, that's where I get my temper. <laughs> so. This is very, this feels very nice tonight. Well, I think, I think, I hope he would be proud with what the conservatory has become in the last oh. uh, several years, not only be, uh, the hall, but the renovation of uh, Inatowich Hall, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are, uh, the conservatory, for those of you who, who may not realize, was founded in 1881, so we'll be celebrating our 125th anniversary, uh, sorry, 1886. So we'll be celebrating our 125th anniversary next year. So you'll be hearing a lot about that as, as the, the months unfold. Uh, but I'm sure we'll have little pictures and uh, memorabilia of your grandfather somewhere in the building. And if you have any, let us know because we'll put it up. Sure. I'm sure we I have the program. I have a few things for you. So tell, tell uh, you know, the reason you're on this gig um, and I've, I've never presented you, I've never heard you live, I've only heard you on, on record before, but Kelly said uh, when we were going through the possible singers that, that could be on, on this series, that, you know, Oscar really loved this girl from Toronto named Carol Wellsman and was one of his favorite singers. Oh, so what, what was your relationship with Oscar and, and, and how did you meet and, and what, did you ever sing with him? I, I actually never did sing with him, we, but we did plan to record. And uh, it was back in, in the 90s when I was going to move and uh, record down in the US. I actually um, asked Oscar, Oscar if he would provide me with a letter for my immigration uh, status and, and for my work visa. And he wrote the most glowing letter. It was embarrassing. So I, I guess I understood that he was that he was a fan even then of my music, so that uh, solidified my position in the U.S. with immigration, which was great. Uh, and then a few years later, I arrived home um, one afternoon, and there was a message on my machine, and it said, hi, Carol, this is Oscar Peterson. Well, I just about fell over, because I, I don't think you'd ever expect to have a message on your machine from Oscar Peterson. I didn't. And so I was already overwhelmed, and he said, I would really like to, to speak with you. And uh, when we did talk, he said, I would like to send your music down to, to the record company, uh, Telarc, where I'm signed in the US. I, I really think that I can help you. And uh, as it turned out, that deal didn't uh, come to fruition, but uh, it was because Oscar felt that he wanted to record with me on a second album. And so one thing led to another, uh, but I, w I was very honored to be able to perform twice uh, when he was receiving Life uh, Achievement Awards in both Mississauga and in Toronto uh, from the conservatory, so uh, I'm blessed. Dave, tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear in the second half. The second half. <laughs> <laughs> Was there another half? <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, uh, let's see. We're going to hear some music written, composed by Oscar Peterson. And we're going to hear uh, a box suite which he put together, which I had the privilege of playing with him on, on many occasions. Uh, this is a three-part movement, three-movement suite, which is kind of based on little melodies that he put together and it's quite it's it's quite good i really enjoy it so his music plus the box suite i think m most casual jazz fans don't think of you know the the big hit that oscar peterson had he, he didn't have assault peanuts he didn't have uh you know like miles davis he didn't didn't have that seminal album uh all blues or but you know what he did have he had night train which was a big hit back in the <laughs> night train 
I'm, I'm wondering why, why he's not more known as a songwriter, because he wrote some incredible, you know, if we talk about Wheatland, yeah, and we talk about the Canadian Suite and Night Train, he's not, the first thing that comes to mind when you think of an Oscar is not as a songwriter, it's as a, as a, as a pianist performer. of other people's music. Right. Well, why do you think that is? You know, I, I don't know. I, I know that he played his own music. Uh, towards the end, he played it almost exclusively. But um, when he played other people's music, I guess they identified with it maybe a little more closely. So maybe that was the reason. But as you say, the compositions that he came up with were very memorable. I mean, some of the ballads are just gorgeous. So yeah, We're, we're going to be hearing a lot of Oscar's music throughout the the series, Hymn to Freedom, Monty Alexander is going to bring, I'm sure Benny Green will bring some, some, some tunes as well. Um, so we're going to continue on with, with the second half of music. Um, don't forget that the uh, Carol will be out signing CDs after the uh, show's over. We have a, a student ensemble outside uh, as well. December 11th is the next concert on this series uh, featuring uh, McCoy Tyner, who probably has the, the next best left hand in, in jazz, I think. Uh, McCoy Tyner made his, his name with uh, the John Coltrane uh, uh, bands of the 60s and then went on to do lots of things by himself. So he'll be playing a solo uh, piano. And before that, we're gonna introduce a new young pianist who I think uh, has the potential to be uh, a great solo pianist and a great uh, solo improviser. Uh, a young Cuban p musician who just defected about a year ago from from Cuba, uh, living in LA now. His name is Alfredo Rodriguez and um, doing an album right now with Quincy Jones producing. And Quincy has not produced a record since Michael Jackson, so uh, Quincy must think there's something there. Do you, do you know uh, Alfredo in LA? Yes, absolutely. And, and, he's, uh, and he's, he's virtual, so. Yeah. So come back to that December 11th, and uh, there might be a special surprise in store for that. We're just going to have a, one piano on stage, two pianists, but maybe someone else will be playing the piano that night as well. You'll have to come and find out. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be here. Okay. I'll be there. <laughs> Still tickets remaining. <laughs> so a second half, Dave, to the bass. Carol, uh, we'll uh, welcome you back at the end of the second half. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 